will now move to the motion before the House this evening. The motion is, this House believes the manipulation of human DNA is an ethical necessity. Please note the wording is ethical necessity, not medical necessity, as it says on your order papers. Without further ado, I look to Linda Trong, Lineker College, to open the case for the proposition. <laughs> For centuries, humanity has been plagued with a slew of genetic diseases, from breast cancer and cystic fibrosis to diabetes and heart disease. Recently, the world has been buzzing about this new gene editing technology, CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR isn't the first gene editing technology known to man, but it's revolutionary in its ease and versatility. For the first time in history, the ability to precisely edit the human genome is not only conceivable, but highly likely. We are on the verge of having the technology to cure genetic mutations and even eradicate some diseases. And so the question tonight, is it an ethical necessity to implement this technology and manipulate human DNA? Mr. President, as the first speaker this evening, it is my honor to introduce your guests. The first, Rahul Gandhi, one of the sons of the Nehru Gandhi family, a prominent Indian political dynasty. He is currently the vice president of the Indian National Congress and chair, oh, wait, wrong Rahul Gandhi. <laughs> Tonight, we are in the presence of Dr. Rahul Gandhi. Once a monk, a neuroscientist, and a doctor, Rahul is now an MBA at Oxford and soon to be an MPH at Harvard. He may not be kin to India's political royalty, but he is no less esteemed. We also have Professor Barbara Evans, director at the Center for Biotechnology and Law and law professor at the University of Houston. Like myself, a fellow Texan somehow lost in British waters. <laughs> and finally, we have Professor Norman Frost, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Professor Frost, I, a little birdie tells me that it's been a couple of decades since you've last worn your tux. It's an honor to have you dusted off and join us tonight, and you look dashing. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. <laughs> However, I have one last introduction to make. There is an honorable member in the audience right now with an EpiPen. Will she please stand up? Thank you. Please pass the EpiPen to the gentleman in your front with the blonde hair. Thank you. Honorable member, suppose I began choking right now. Suppose I broke out in hives and fell to the floor. I'm experiencing a severe allergic reaction to something, maybe Rahul's cologne. <laughs> I'm going to go into anaphylactic shock, and you have the EpiPen. What do you do? Do you put the EpiPen away and sit by? Wait for my 10 minutes on the floor, literally on the floor, to end, so we can move on to the next speaker, the person you actually came here to see? <laughs> or do you save my life? Why? You would save my life, I hope, <laughs> because there is little difference between letting someone die when you have the means to save them and killing them yourself. There are an estimated 70,000 people worldwide who suffer from cystic fibrosis, over 350,000 worldwide who suffer from Huntington's disease. The crazy thing about these numbers is they represent the rare monogenic diseases. 
the quote-unquote easy cases where the disease can be isolated to a single gene. When we account for more complicated polygenic diseases or even genetic predisposition to certain diseases, we begin to include cancer, diabetes, heart disease, some of the world's leading causes of death. Is it within our rights as a society to deny these millions of people access to a technology that could save or drastically improve their quality of life? Manipulating the human genome has the potential to cure diseases, not just treat the symptoms. It doesn't require a pill to clear your lungs or an insulin shot to keep you stable. The monumental potential of this technology is exciting. In a century, gene modification could act just like a vaccine. We could begin to eradicate genetic diseases similar to how vaccinations eradicated smallpox. The World Health Organization began its global immunization campaign in 1967, and the last case of smallpox reported was in 1977. UNICEF estimates 5 million deaths are prevented each year due to the eradication of smallpox. This means that between 1977 and today, 195 million lives have been spared. To put that in perspective for you, that's more than the combined population of the United Kingdom, Spain, and Germany. The benefits of gene editing become even more pronounced when we move beyond direct therapeutic applications, such as gene therapy or germline modification, and begin to consider the indirect benefits of CRISPR-Cas9. Since 2012, the manipulation of human DNA using CRISPR has provided us a better means for developing and studying disease models and offered a more direct way of probing and understanding human genetics. Even without reaching a clinical stage, the information we stand to gain from a research setting is invaluable. And this brings us to the crux of the debate. The ethical necessity of gene editing arises from opportunity cost. Because it's not only about the consequences of our action, it's also about the consequences of our inaction. It's easy to argue that modifying human DNA is opening a Pandora's box, that we shouldn't meddle with things we don't understand. In April last year, a group of scientists at Sun Yat-sen University in China attempted to use CRISPR to remove the gene for a fatal blood disorder from non-viable embryos. Only four out of 54 embryos were successfully modified. With such a low success rate, it's understandable to fear the ramifications of gene editing. It's a fair point, because CRISPR is still in its infancy. This technology is not ready for clinical testing. However, this does not suggest that we should halt research, nor does it imply that gene manipulation should never be an option. Because the science is improving, as it always does, in January of this year, a research group at MIT developed a new version of CRISPR-Cas9 with better specificity, reaching error rates of below detectable limits. And this is the nature of scientific research. Experiments rarely ever work the first time. <laughs> if that were the case, my PhD would be much shorter and significantly easier. Improvements in biological research come in small increments, not large leaps. Yes, there are countless things about the genome that we don't yet understand, but trying to understand is the foundation of scientific research. Fear of the unknown is a cheap reason to dismiss a potentially revolutionary technology. Earlier, I pose tonight's debate. Is the manipulation of human DNA an ethical necessity? But that's too simple. The ethical question is not whether we should or should not pursue genetic modifications in humans. The ethical question is, where should we draw the line? Unlike its predecessor, this is an extremely complicated question on an incredibly nuanced topic. 
The implications span not only the scientific realm, but also extends into politics. How can we regulate this technology? Is it possible to reach an international consensus? Economy, how can we make this accessible to everyone, rich and poor alike, and society? What exactly exemplifies a disease? How do we distinguish between treating diseases like Alzheimer's versus treating diseases like ADHD? So, the ethical conundrum does not lie within the technology itself, but how we use it. Because CRISPR, like fire, is simply a tool. It can provide much needed light and warmth in the dark, cold, and damp. And anyone who's experienced an Oxford winter should know what that's like. Or, if we're not careful, fire can burn us. But do you want to live in a world without it? Can you imagine an endless Oxford winter? <laughs> the potential of this technology to save lives warrants caution and regulation rather than a blanket prohibition. An unconditional no, no to germline modification, no to gene therapy, no to developmental research is too easy of an answer for such a complex question. It is therefore our moral obligation to first say yes, then determine the ethical limits under which we should proceed. So tonight, I'm asking you to consider the opportunity cost of shunning genetic engineering, to think of the lives we could but wouldn't save if we simply ignored this technology, to think of me lying crumpled on the floor because everyone put away the EpiPen and passively sat by. Thank you.